Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a great show for you tonight, a continuation of last week's show where we interviewed uh, Richard Van Grunsman of Vans Aircraft, founder of Vans Aircraft, and we got so much great information last week that we changed our programming, and we are having a show this evening that includes uh, Van as well as uh, Ryan and Greg from over at the factory, and uh, we're going to get a tour of the factory, ask lots of questions, and get much more information on that. We appreciate you taking the time this evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. Before we get started, a couple of quick notes. First of all, a recording of tonight's broadcast will be available within a couple days on YouTube on Social Flight's YouTube channel. Just search on Social Flight. One word on YouTube, that should bring it up, and you'll be able to see that if you have any problems or have to uh, take off early from the show. Uh, the other thing is that we will have multiple webcams tonight, of course, with our different guests. And during that time, we'll try to uh, turn some on and off if it helps to see larger what we're going to do, especially walking around the factory floor. But it is something that, uh, if, that uh, you can actually control somewhat yourself from either the app or from uh, using it on your PC. Uh, if you look at the viewer, it'll have some controls there for you. In addition to that, Send us your questions. Uh, there is a Q and A section as well that is part of the uh, uh, webinar product. You can send your questions. We'll do our best to fit those directly in. We're not going to directly uh, have a Q and A session per se uh, directly. I'll be feeding those through, um, but we'll do our best to uh, to get some of that information across to you. Uh, lastly. As always, I like to uh, have a quick update on what we're seeing in general aviation through Social Flight. Social Flight reaches over 200,000 pilots through our free mobile apps and website, and we are dedicated to supporting general aviation. We do that by having tens of thousands of events, webinars, all sorts of things, and destinations, places that you can fly. We're even giving away a light speed headset through our Fly to Win Challenge. So be sure to check that out and get more information about Social Flight through there. What we are seeing by being able to see the general aviation activity is really amazing. It's, uh, it's a continued comeback even as we go a little bit uh, into uh, sunsetting the summer flying season, for those of us in the uh, colder parts of the country here in New England as we're strongly into fall, um, now we actually uh, are still seeing rising events and people traveling, which is really, really great for general aviation as a whole. In addition to that, uh, uh, I spent quite a bit of time talking with other people in the industry, and uh, we're seeing a, a very large number of aircraft sales and purchases happening very quickly. Now, the difference between this rise in aircraft sales and in some of what's been seen in the past from the folks that uh, I've been talking to is that we're not seeing a depression in the market. We're actually seeing an increase in the value of aircraft um, that's happening as many people have used uh, the crisis as an opportunity to reevaluate if they're going to fly. And for some people, that means that they're going to be doing less of it. And so they may have chosen to uh, sell their plane. Uh, but for far more uh, people out there, there's a lot of people that have chosen uh, this as a time to decide that it doesn't make sense for them to rent anymore, it makes sense for them to buy. And so a lot of activity in turnover in general aviation uh, aircraft. And that translates into investment. Uh, just like uh, when people buy a house, they uh, they invest, and so people are uh, putting new avionics in, paint interior, engines, you name it, a lot of activity, which is great because we really do have a fragile industry. It's our passion. It's certainly mine, and I'm sure it is yours, and so it's very important that it's healthy for everyone out there. And so with that, I would like to begin the show by welcoming uh, Richard Van Grunsven, Greg Hughes, and Ryan Johnson here uh, to the show. I'm going to bring them all online uh, now. Um, you know, it's uh, everyone probably knows Van, founder, of course, of Vans Aircraft. Ryan Johnson is vice president and chief engineer at Vans. How are you doing, Ryan? Very good. Good to see you. And Greg Hughes is director uh, at Vans, who also has been instrumental in setting up these, uh, uh, being part of the show here at Social Flight Live. How are you doing, Greg? Good. Good to see you, Jeff. So, uh, guys, thank you so much for taking the time this evening to join us. And I see behind you, Greg, uh, you're there right uh, on the shop floor <laughs> with with a whole yep. lot of very cool airplane parts behind you. Yep, I'm in the uh, I'm in the warehouse in the quick build section right now. Excellent, nice. So, um, 
uh, let Van, I'd like to start with you. Uh, when tell me about the history of this facility? Like, when did you move to this to this building and and really start to get things consolidated at at the level that you're at now? Okay, yes, we moved to our our current site on the uh, Aurora State Airport in uh, year 2000. Um, matter of fact, just just barely 20 years ago. We had been in the small town of North Plains, Oregon, about 30 miles from here, for the prior about 20 years, really, in um, a couple of two different facilities. It was definitely a, a growth period. Uh, when we started in 1973, we didn't really have a factory to speak of. I still had the workshop in the loft of my father's barn and uh, also had a, a one-car garage in the duplex that my new wife and I had uh, rented. So it's pretty humble, pretty modest. <laughs> Talk about home industry, cottage industry. But uh, after a couple of steps, we had uh, grown a bit and moved to um, the town of North Plains. And I had a, from 1981 through 88 factory located right on the Sunset Airstrip at, at North Plains, a non-commercial field, but yeah, you know, that's where we were. With a small uh, factory, started out with about four employees there, had grown to 18 or 19 and bursting at the seams. Found a bigger building in North Plains, which we moved into with more space than we could ever use. In three years, it was bursting at the seams. Put up another building, rented a couple more spaces, and found this property at the Aurora Airport and uh, managed to purchase it, put up a purpose-built building. The first time we were in a really purpose-built structure, several times the size of what we had before. And uh, that's where we've been ever since. Uh, <clears throat> we're pretty well bursting at the seams again. So uh, um, it, as Greg shows you around the plant there pretty soon, you'll be able to see uh, just what the layout is and uh, how well it, it basically has worked pretty well. Uh, coming in, it was sort of a, a guessing game, just how do we want to lay things out um, from the, um, well, basically, what did we have four or five buildings before with stuff scattered all around? How do you consolidate that? efficiently and and get the right uh, positioning and the right workflow and all of that it uh, I think we made some uh, good approximations and uh, it's functioned over those 20 years and we've grown some more in that time so wow so I didn't I didn't realize that you built the you actually built this uh, this this factory that's uh, that that's great that's a that that seems to be uh, a landmark point of a company's evolution when instead of moving into the spaces that other people have designed and fitting into there, you actually you actually build one that fits you. Right, <clears throat> right. It was uh, definitely a big financial move, but um, it worked out. Sometimes you have to take little gambles that way, and uh, we kind of knew what we were doing. We are pretty sure of it. We didn't really yeah. go overboard. We were um, confident that we could utilize that space efficiently and that it wouldn't be a, a financial burden to to have this much space. Now, uh, Van, a lot of the uh, the technology, and Ryan uh, as well, and, and Greg can show some of this, uh, one of the things, of course, that, that really sets Van's aircraft apart in the maturity of the product line, of course, is ease of construction, match hull construction, and the things that you've done to advance the technology. Um, Ryan, can you talk a little bit about the the technology itself, some of the things that make it both more buildable for you as well as for owners? Sure. Uh, Greg's doing a good job of showing you parts there. We just went by the parts that have the holes in the understructure as well as the skin. So we were really the first company that advanced uh, the technology where you didn't have to have jigs anymore. And, uh, you know, if the, the seagull runs into your leading edge skin, you take it off and uh, the new skin will click right back into the understructure. And that <laughs> was the, the huge leap forward. <laughs> I can say, Ryan, that, that from my experience, kind of as, as an A&P and IA out in the field, 
can you do me a favor and get all the other companies out there in the world making production certified aircraft to make it possible? No, no, we would. That? <laughs> That's what gives us the advantage. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, there is this press release when Cessna came out with the Skycatcher, and uh, I actually clipped it out and saved it somewhere, and it says that we finally have matchful technology like Vans Aircraft. So that was a little. Uh, a little moment as an engineer here where, ah, yes, we've made it, you know. And, uh, yeah, Van was proud of that little clip, too. So They made that uh, public? They did that public, yes. That was a public <laughs> press release. Uh, so if you that, that really took things off because it took an airplane where you had to lay the holes out and uh, made it accessible to a lot of people that normally wouldn't be builders. You didn't have to be as much of a craftsman. You could just assemble it. Greg is walking down towards the punch press, and we got our first one when, Van, 94, 96? Sometime around the mid-90s, yes. And, 90s, and, uh, right. And initially, it was, it was that a, machine. <laughs> no. Still running. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, initially, we got the machine. And it was kind of like putting holes in skins, but not putting holes in everything. And I think it wasn't until we moved here, Ryan, and and uh, had just uh, got better engineering programming that uh, we could actually make the, the true matching parts. Right. There's a lot of math that goes into it. Um, the holes, you have to keep things very accurate um, in both the understructure. And for a simple slab-sided fuselage, it's easy. But once you start to get into compound curves, not compound curves, but more complex shapes, uh, it becomes more difficult. Roughly, if it's not going together, uh, you need to go back and look at what you're doing wrong because you might have clicked it together incorrectly. Mm. But that shows you are, we have three of these punch presses uh, and there is, it's uh, air controlled, uh, hydraulic, and uh, it's, of course, the sheet's moving around and the punch will come down. We can make any shape. Uh, I've never been restricted as a designer in the shapes that I can punch out. And those sheets will go from there over to what we now have is a uh, computer-controlled press break. If you turn around, they are straight ahead of you. So all the programs for the sheets are in the computer. We could pull up a program for a bent part and uh, reproduce it one at a time if we wished. Uh, you know, so for lean manufacturing, it really changed the game um, and the accuracy as well. Once the computer is memorized a part, it will be exactly on the next time. Hmm. So you'll see some parts getting bent up there and uh, bend our wing spars. All the parts are manufactured at this facility, uh, except for the composite parts, which are done locally uh, outside of vans. Ryan, let, let me uh, pause for a second and kind of go back. What is the uh, uh, what? What are the cases that you'd use a punch press for things versus uh, kind of jetting or laser lasering? I, I I didn't realize that with a punch you can you it's so versatile that you can do all of those different things. These punches will punch uh, thick steel, but just uh, so we can keep the longevity of the equipment, we would farm that out uh, to a water jet. Um, probably bring in a laser eventually, but there'll be some fatigue testing that we want to do there uh, before we do that. There's a lot of fatigue testing that we've done in the past on the punch parts. Uh, we've worked with local universities uh, here to do research projects. So bring one of these machines in, it's a planned uh, process. Is there a so difference in terms of shapes and abilities when you think about doing things with other technologies versus the punching? No, the punching, you can create a punch uh, tool that's custom shaped. Uh, we've created a number, we have about 40 custom punch tools that, that we have in-house uh, to create our parts. Mm. Mm. It's very simple to, to make. It's a, you know, a male and a female die and you have to get the clearances right. There's science in it, but in concept, it's pretty simple. Wow. And uh, are there any types of preparations that are done on any of the uh, uh, any of the metal components, or is all that up to the builder for for most, things like corrosion protection, et cetera? Uh, oh yeah, uh, the the major components like the spars. Greg's looking at uh, what we call the waffle plate. There, it's really just a spar doubler, and that would uh, next step it would go through a time saver, so it's going to deburr the part. 
After that, we'll send the parts out to anodize and they'll return to the spar assembly area, which you'll get over to. There's a time saver right there. And if you keep going, other parts, uh, we want to protect we, What is the time? Can you explain a time saver? Sure, sure. Uh, it's uh, basically a sanding drum. So at two sides, it sands. Uh, this one only sands one side at once. You have to flip the parts over. Rather inefficient. But um, they go through here. We can throw two or three spars through at a time. And uh, a sanding drum that that uh, sands the part comes out this side and then it would go out to anodize and you can go over to the uh the riveting center there if you would greg please so after they go to anodize which is done out of house uh, we try to avoid chemicals in house for the most part we come to this station uh, and we have kind of a assembly that a spar would roll around on and an operator can easily roll it around on this smooth surface and then, uh, of course, just a foot pedal, rivet it together. It goes very quickly. Um, and do we have an assembled spar sitting around? Yeah, there's the rivets. We were doing center sections here recently. Oh, there's a spar bar. <laughs> yeah, here we go. So those, those have been assembled here recently. So you get an anodized part. All the critical parts come anodized. All the steel parts, we powder coat those. Um, the, the normal, uh, aluminum, that's the majority of the kit is 2024 T3 Alclad. So it does have that aluminum, uh, barrier. We've done extensive testing. We have test samples that have been out there on the fence since North Plains days. We moved them over here when we moved to this building. And, uh, for the most part, the Alclad will do just fine. In a marine environment, you'd probably want something more. And as long as you don't scratch the Alclad, that's where it really, uh, becomes an issue. So when the, the aluminum first comes in, we cover it with a vinyl and that protects it while we manufacture it and until you assemble the part. And then it's just Got up it. to the builder where you're at. If you're in Florida, if you're here in Oregon, you probably want to prime the inside. If you're in you know, Arizona, not so much. It does Got increase it. the resale value. And I just want to make a quick note to all our viewers because we're getting some questions. Again, from what we noted in the beginning, you control on your viewer what you see. So if you are only seeing the person who's speaking, you can go up in your viewer and you can change that so you can see all of them, uh, uh, everyone there. That way you'll be able to see what Ryan is talking about. It's up to you. You have control on, uh, on what you actually see. Again, go to the area that says everyone or switch it to see the speaker. It's in the viewer. Um, Van, can you tell me a little bit? I mean, this is obviously a pretty, pretty big evolution. What were, were there were there key points in the history of the company where you you made those those giant leaps forward of uh, reproducibility? I wouldn't say any giant leaps. It, it's been uh, pretty um, well evolutionary, I guess. Obviously, as mentioned earlier, when we got our first. Uh, um, uh, CNC punch. It was um, a big investment. Um, we had been getting some of that work done at job shops before, which is kind of inefficient. You got to work it into their schedule. You got to transport material back and forth. So we got that and um, she, I think it paid for itself in about a year. So sometimes, <laughs> which for heavy machinery is, is a very short payoff time. So that yeah. was a big step. Then it was a, a big step when we decided to really try for a matched hole. And uh, I was a little reluctant, kind of old school, I guess, just not realizing how accurately the respective parts could be made. But um, we did that and it just been, we've been able to, to, even though we had matched hole almost 20 years ago, there are different, uh, degrees of that. Uh, uh, we can do more parts more accurately with a, a greater fit than before. Ryan could probably fill in a little there. But uh, other than that, though, um, there haven't been any that I can recall major changes. It's, it's mostly uh, very logical progressions that we make sometime a matter of doing things uh, in-house rather than outsourcing. And probably recently we've been bringing more work in rather than outsourcing. It just depends upon what the volume of work is 
and um, you know, what our capabilities are, how we see the uh, the profitability. Got anything to add to that, Ryan? No, pretty pretty close. Uh, for the first 20 years I worked here, I think we had about four new pieces of equipment, and we're pushing 15 in the last two years. So <laughs> it's been quite an expansion. But it, you know, we were able to increase the quality of the parts, and and builders should see that. Um, bringing in the new CNC equipment, uh, three new CNC centers, a turning center, and then two uh, mills. That's new for us, and then a hydro press that we're bringing in as well. So accuracy of the parts is even going to be greater than it was in the past. Now, um, obviously, with these types of things, there's also emerging technologies. Have have you uh, are there you know plastic parts now that you're looking into doing possibly 3D printing? Do you see that in your future, or other technologies to to start doing uh, other parts that um, that aren't perhaps metal and uh, would help with the build? Sure, always aware of that. Um, metal 3D printing, I think, has some promise. I actually looked at that a couple of years ago for uh, a pedo tube, uh, but I can get pedo tubes, you know, uh, more cheaply from other manufacturing sources. Um, but for prototypes, we do use 3D printing. Uh, Greg's going towards. Uh, we just got a new larger format 3D printer back here. We have a laser machine that Greg was responsible bringing in on the right. Um, but yeah, we just use that for prototyping. The fatigue properties of 3D prints that are just plastic, uh, we only have one production 3D printed part right now uh, that's printed off of this type of additive manufacturing. And SLS, which is laser sintering, which is a much hotter temperature and a stronger part, we have a stick grip that's uh, SLS printed, I'm trying to think of anything else, but that's done out of house. And that, uh, you said that's done out of house for like the grips? Because that's house. really what I was thinking of is a lot of people uh, end up doing things that are more uh, ergonomic on the inside of the aircraft, uh, right. not, 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 you know, fatigue critical structures. And I didn't know whether there's things that people can even do on their, on their own that they end up using inside that'll, that'll again be non-structural, but, uh, but help them out. And if you see 3D printing being part of the future. Oh, it is, uh, but uh, additive is not there yet uh, for fatigue values. What Greg was just showing you is our, our new fatigue test machine. This used to be done out of house, and uh, to do fatigue tests through a lab, you know, you're talking uh, five digits to do a, a, a good fatigue test study with a large sample size. So we did the math and said, well, why don't we go get a uh, refurbished fatigue test machine with uh, new high-end software? And we'll be running a number of fatigue studies through this machine. Um, and there's, you know, Greg is over the uh, the tech help department, and they give us good feedback on common points in the airplane where builders have, uh, you know, questions or mistakes, and we'll be able to design better solutions for that. Can you give me an example of something that would be you'd use that that machine for having to do with fatigue testing and the type of thing that you'd be looking at? Sure. Uh, yeah, I have a bag of, of parts here. <laughs> As a matter of fact, oh, let's see, I just can grab one of these samples. But, uh, you know, we do uh, dimple some holes on the punch press, and that was a, a long fatigue study because you have to design the, uh, the tooling so that you don't have a, a dimple that breaks early. But this would be an example of, I don't know if you could see that. Uh -huh. There's a riveted hole. Now this this goes in the the fatigue tester and it grips it on either side and that would apply a force uh, over time and we were able to almost double the fatigue life over a hand dimpled hole of doing it with the uh, the punch press. Really? So uh, you know you, you design the tooling correctly and figure out why it's failing and where it's failing. Um, it's an interesting study. Absolutely. When you're dimpling, you're stretching the material. And when you stretch right. it, it's potential for cracking. And right. sometimes there are microscopic cracks that don't really show up until the material is used a lot. Yeah. It goes through a lot of minor flex. It's like, a hard time focus. So this is sort of what, what this machine is able to duplicate or, or synthesize. Back to Ryan. 
Yeah. Well, I and I know from from you know a lot of different things out, out there and a lot of people that have, have worked on different aircraft, of course, that when you do that, you get that stretching. You you almost have to start in some cases with a smaller hole, because even the hole size, of course, is gonna is gonna grow during dimpling from the manual process. Is that correct? Correct. There's a there's actually a, a mil spec standard for the hole size relative to the uh, dimple die tooling sizes. Um, but of course, the the details. If you really want to extend the fatigue life, you have there's a lot of uh, just what Van said. You're plastically deforming not only the dimple itself where it's uh, being bent around, but also the area that the dimple die is pressing on. So you're work hardening the surface. And and uh, what part? What types of uh, parts of the aircraft do uh, do you either now or do you see in the future that the factory will be doing the the dimpling on instead of the the uh, builder? Where we developed this process was for the RV-12. The RV-12, we didn't want the builder to have any complex tooling. So the, on the leading edge, uh, we did not want to trip the airflow. It made a, a difference in the stall speed of the aircraft, uh, the flying characteristics of the aircraft. So for the, the front row of rivets, we needed those to be dimpled on the skin. But um, of course, we didn't want the rig is going towards that airplane. And uh, so the front row of rivets, we dimple them before they're um, rolled into shape and uh, delivered to the customer. Uh, unfortunately, Absolutely. if we look at the 51% rule for the other kits, that's what limits me from dimpling the skins. A, a lot of uh, getting the 51% category right has to do with, uh, you know, the, the customer dimpling the parts. You get credit for that on the 51% uh, EAB. That's yeah, not leading edge there, Greg. You'll be able to see the flush rivets. Might not show up here. Yeah, there they are. So those are all pre-dimpled on the the Trump machine. That is very very cool. So uh, let's switch gears for a minute um, and and talk just a little bit more about kind of like the the business in general and what happens there at the factory now. Um, uh, first of all, what what's at any given time your most popular model? Um, I haven't checked with the sales department. Uh, Greg, are you uh, are you abreast of the the sales levels of the different models? Hello. I, I sure am. I am. Yeah. Uh, so most of the time, for the last year or so, our most commonly most popular models uh, for new starts, especially, are the RV14 and the RV10. Uh, mm -hmm. Other models are following pretty close behind the RV7 and 7A are still very popular, the 9 and 9A, the RV8, uh, really, really popular model. Some of the models that are the older style kits, the RV3 and the RV4, we still sell a few here and there, uh, but they're on limited production run, and so we, uh, we're just not, not making nearly as many of those. Um, and as far as just general business, um, this year, uh, business has been very, very strong. So, um, and, uh, the, uh, one of the things we're seeing also is the RB14 as, as a model is building very, very quickly. And one of the reasons that people are saying that they're going with an RB14 is A, is bigger, a little bigger, and they like that. Uh, it's fast. Uh, got a lot of, lot of lifting and climbing power, um, but it builds quickly. People have built the RB14 in you know, 12 to 18 months fairly commonly. And some people build it, it takes a little while longer, but... Um, the buildability of the newer kits is, is a lot of what's driving the RB10 and RB14 and the RB12 popularity. Makes makes a lot of sense. And how do you handle uh, support of, I mean, you've got from the three all the way up to the 14, and and I understand you support all of them. How do you how do you handle that? Well, from the from the builder technical support side, I'll, I'll answer that and then hand it off to Ryan because I know Ryan definitely has some thoughts on this. Uh, and understands the complications of it. So we've actually expanded our builder technical support team over the last year. So we've added people to it simply because the number of kits being built, the number of different models that are being built and the different skills and technology required to do those things simply requires that we add people. So, you know, it's one of those good problems to have, right? You know, the more, the more kits there are out there and the more different variety of builders, uh, uh, it just it just means that we have to be able to staff that. It's one of the things we're really known for is doing, uh, really supporting the community, being part of the community, and the community doing its own self-support. 
that's facilitating that. So uh, it's, that's a real important thing. But but it is a highly complex um, and sometimes rather trying thing in order to be able to uh, efficiently and well support you know everything from the original RV three all the way through you know the RV fourteen and fourteen A now and everything else in between. And uh, Ryan, maybe you have some thoughts on that. No, not much. You do a great job, Greg. Uh, when you came in here, Greg actually sits across the room from me. And one of the reasons I wanted it that way was so we could communicate all the time. And so he's, uh, you know, communicating the issues back. Um, we've expanded engineering as well by about 30%. And that was, Greg, that was your idea. It was a great idea uh, to get a true sustaining engineering department. So, uh, you know, three engineers just to look at uh, ongoing issues and let the rest of the engineering department um, focus on the future. There's yeah. been a lot of investment, a lot of investment in vans in the last couple of years. I've been here for about two and a half years. You know, Ryan mentions the three engineers that we hired this year. I mean, for van to hire for vans to hire one engineer is <laughs> is a very unusual thing. And we hired three at the same time this year. The investments, some of the machinery that you've seen that we've invested in over the last two years. You know, the new fast punch press that said 5,000 on the side, all of the CNC machinery, some of the testing machinery and what have you, all of that is new investment on the part of Vans. And so it's, uh, Vans' point earlier, you know, I mean, it's it's not without risk, but, um, you know, uh, uh, frankly, the person who's making most of those decisions, standing by and putting his neck on the line is Ryan. And he's, uh, you know, making smart decisions. And uh, if, if we make smart decisions and, and also have cool design ideas and what have you, then, you know, we just keep on moving. And this company is, I feel very fortunate to be part of a company that's done a really great job of that ever since Van started it back in the early 70s with the with the RB3 and, and Evolve. There is a focus on safety. Uh, um, I think that's a cornerstone of what Van could tell you. Uh, he's passed on. And, you know, there's a, a satisfaction in seeing uh, we have a safety record equivalent of general aviation with mm -hmm. RVs, and that's a culture van has ever since we had the aviator back in the day, and he'd write articles for that or write articles for other magazines. Uh, it's really started there and, and went forward from there, but it's, it's shown in the numbers. So if we can design, uh, for example, the, the RV12 that's, if Greg does a 180, has a canopy latch warning system that when you bring the RPM above X RPM and you have the canopy not latched, it will have a person's voice. And I went to all the, the manufacturers, all the major manufacturers and had them develop the same system. And uh, it'll talk to you and say, uh, check canopy latch. We've had zero instances of people taking off with the canopy latch open. So we're working with industry, bringing collaborative together. Uh, the, the recent Cavalico press, fuel pressure sensor uh, issue, that was something we, we heard about and uh, brought different manufacturers together uh, to solve. So, um, you know, it's just, you get as much satisfaction out of improving safety and actually seeing it come out in the numbers as you do bringing out new designs. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Now, along those lines, um, Van, when you, you know, one of the things, of course, you've got a, a spectrum of different types of uh, of companies and philosophies in experimental aviation and, and kit builds all the way from, here's some plans uh, to, uh, I think you guys are probably as, as far to the side of having everything perfect and done, made a certain way, and as you mentioned, as safe as possible. Um, how do you view the experimentation and variances side from builders, uh, from small changes that builders might want to do to uh, big changes like using different alternative engines or things like that. How does that fit in with your company philosophy and how do you approach that with people who uh, who want to build one of your planes but, but want to put their own spin on it? Well, may, uh, mainly we uh, have always been pretty conservative. All of our airplanes, even though they're fast and sporty and high performance, are based on uh, long established, well-proven technology and aerodynamics. So that we've tried to make a, a safe airplane all along. We've put more emphasis on low landing speed than some of the other fast airplanes have. Uh, as far as uh, builder modifications and variations, uh, obviously within the experimental category, 
the builder is the manufacturer. So he has the capability of doing any uh, minor or major changes that he wants. We generally just advise and caution people on uh, not straying too far from, from the well or from the path. So that uh, just, just uh, carefully analyze what you do, remind them that we had uh, have thoroughly designed and tested the, the kit that we have, that what we're offering has some uh, verification behind it. Um, as far as engines, we've taken a little heat on that uh, the, because we're, we're not very, uh, we're not, don't encourage people to do a lot of experimentation in the power plant field. Either that of using alternative or non-aircraft engines or in trying to modify air, the aircraft engines uh, too extensively, but mainly trying to get more power. Um, we have not yet designed a glider. We don't consider our airplanes to be great gliders, so we want the engine to keep running. Uh, so really it's a matter of um, having the, 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 the builder do a serious uh, analysis right. of just what choice he may want to make. Mm -hmm. So it's really a very conservative approach. Uh, anything else there, Ryan? No, that's uh, pretty straightforward. I think the safety record shows and uh, you know backs that up. Just what you've you've indicated that when you stay close to the path, you're going to have a higher level of safety, especially in the engine area. Um, but still, these are custom. That's part of the joy of building these airplanes. They're custom built. You know, the RV12. You have to stay on the path because it's a LSA aircraft. Right. But uh, you know, even after you build an ELSA, you can do what you want with that airplane, uh, right. at least in the United States. Right. Um, so you're conservative, but you're not quite at the level of, uh, of we'll only sell it to you if you sign that you're only going to do, you correct. know, a Lycoming no, engine no. in it. I like That's to see that innovation. I, I, Greg is great at, uh, if Van wants to chime in here, I'll let him go. No, 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 not that much other than um, actually I lost my, my, my thought Sorry. pattern there. It's kind of repeating what I said before, though, of uh, carefully analyzing what you're going to do. And, uh, uh, you know, is this kind of a wild idea? Is it really based on solid uh, aerodynamic or engineering logic? Uh, people have experimented with different wing tips, for instance. That's fairly benign unless you really get carried away. Wing tips is an area that people think you can gain tremendous benefits from uh, some exotic shape. Um, our experience is that's not not much benefit to really be had there, but it's an area that you can mess around with and uh, put a lot of time into just to be disappointed, but uh, not, not likely to hurt that much. Over the years, we've had some people try things that are more dramatic, but it's been pretty rare. I think part of that is that we've offered a, a basically good kit um, and that builders will look at it and realize that um, if there were easy ways to do it better, we probably would have tried it. Right. So that kind of give us the credit for providing them something that maybe sort of middle of the road is going to work and is going to best protect their soft backside. I think one yeah, of the, one of the uh, you know, catch 22s of that is, is to some degree in the industry when it comes to things like power plants, people look at it and say, well, everything is so rock solid about any of the van's aircraft that if you only want to be, uh, you know, looking at what you're going to do with power plant, and I'm talking about companies like, for example, who are the, the ones developing new power plants and things like that, they're almost attracted to using your aircraft because they know they don't have to worry about everything else. And the only variable that they're, do, they're doing is that. The unfortunate part, of course, is, you know, we've all been going to, to AirVenture for decades. And we, with the exception of Rotax, we have seen so many <laughs> engines come and go and come and go. And none of them have really stood the test of time of being better than the aircraft engines or the Rotax. And 
And at the same time, it'd be nice if that happened someday. Definitely, and uh, I kind of missed that point that advised people to um, just again, look at the history of, uh, we've been around, I've been around for, it seemed like forever, but it, uh, a lot of promising engines have come and gone, but there's always something new and people look, uh, obviously are looking for something better and I certainly can't fault that. We would love to have something dramatically better. Uh, it's just that we haven't found it yet. And the closer you look, um, while the traditional aircraft engines, primarily Lycoming in, in our instance, they really do the job that they were designed for. And uh, automobile engines, for instance, do a great job in an automobile, the purpose for which they were intended. Um, and just very simply, that in the automobile, they rarely run at more than 25 or 30 percent power. In an airplane, you're asking them to do a different job um, in, in a lot of ways, not just the, the higher um, continual power output, but one has to, has to look at all of that. And the Lycoming sometimes is referred to a tractor engine. Well, tractors run at full throttle. I know, I was raised on a farm. <laughs> the engines are heavy and low power, low RPM, but they do that job just like the, the traditional aircraft engine does. And uh, the Rotax is an ex exception to that in that they have a, a small displacement, high RPM engine. But Rotax about 20, 25 years ago, ventured into their model 936, which was really the same technology in a larger uh, 200 to 300 horsepower engine and it didn't really make the cut. Uh, hopefully something like that will and, and offer us um, more opportunities. Uh, but uh, at this point, to, at least to that extent, had been tried. Yeah. And, it's, and, and people have often wondered why we don't um, venture into that field. And it's like, well, um, Rotax was doing it. They were doing it quietly at the time, confidentially, and we were definitely working with them, but it didn't come to fruition. So my only right. point there is that we do look at opportunities when, when, they, when they arise. We're not blind to that, but still have to come down to the decision. And uh, we did not design a series of airplanes around an engine that didn't yet exist which we might have done, you know, if we, right. If, so it's just, just an example that very few are aware of that was a promising engine, similar to auto engines in a lot of ways, as, as far as the low displacement, high RPM, electronic, everything, but um, it, it um, was never really marketed. Yeah. So, so is it fair to say then, Van, that, that your team there and Ryan, that, that everybody is always looking at, at all the different, uh, you know, engines that are being offered and watching those, but uh, it, you're, you're waiting until, it's not that you're, you're, you're sold only on Lycoming and Rotax, but you're, you're waiting for one to prove itself enough to make you comfortable and meet your, your threshold. We definitely, right. we definitely pay attention to what's being developed. And it's been said that we only support the Lycoming because we make a lot of money selling them. Well, that's not totally true. If there was an engine that was truly revolutionary, we could sell a lot more kits, make a lot more money than we do selling engines. Ryan, what did you have? Uh, no, uh, just what was already covered. Uh, yeah, we have conversations at Oshkosh with nearly every engine manufacturer. So uh, many of them stop by the booth. Really, it's a chicken and egg situation, unfortunately, where the engine manufacturer has to make an investment in new technology. You know, we the, the most recent development, of course, was the Rotax 912 IS. And we saw it with the electronic uh, control on that engine, a uh, 25% reduction in fuel burn, and the absolute ceiling on the airplane went from about 13,500 with the carbureted ULS up to almost 20,000. 
So you had an airplane that would struggle over the Rockies at gross weight or would operate at Denver easily, just like any other RV in the 12 IS. That was an amazing leap forward. Do we want that on a Continental or a Lycoming? Yes. Have they given it to us yet? No. So everybody, please put the pressure on as we do. And ultimately, you're, you know, where we spend our money, but ask for it. Uh, when you stop by the Lycoming Continental booth, ask for it. We ask for it, but, you know, it's an investment on their part. Um, right. What about, go, uh, what about, you know, diesel for the rest of the world that has a harder time with avgas and even regular gas for, for the planes that aren't really suitable for the 912? We have installations. Uh, mainly we let uh, those be developed by third parties. I support those. Uh, I support them with CAD data. Uh, I've supported DERs that have worked on those projects, even in the United States, for people that live over in Africa. Uh, we, you know, we have a current project, I'll tell you, going on in that regard. But the market just isn't there. Right. And uh, to give you an idea that there is an engine manufacturer that came to us with the diesel, and they said, well, you know, I said, what's the OEM price? And it was a six-digit figure. <laughs> and because we don't make that many, well, I said, somebody has to jump first and it's not the, the home builder with a pocketbook, you know, right. If, if you lower the price, we'll sell more of these, but until that happens, the diesel won't be a reality. Right. Now, um, uh, for, for all of you, uh, kind of to weigh in, there's obviously been a lot of talk in general aviation. We're no, we're not there yet, but that the future is going to be some form of electric at some point. Um, and, and then, even though we're not necessarily ready yet, there's obviously some, some you know, er, early adopters that are even starting. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on where that's going to go? Well, let me take that a bit. I think uh, the consensus is now, and this is not something unique at fans, the realization that battery technology is really the, the crucial factor right now the energy density of the batteries just isn't there. I've been flying an electric airplane for 12 years. Surprise, surprise. It's an electric self launch sail plane. A big airplane, a 20 meter span, et cetera. Um, it's got 200 pounds of batteries. Those 200 pounds of batteries are capable of running my 56 horsepower motor 70, at 75% power for 18 minutes on 200 pounds of batteries. If we had 180 horsepower Lycoming, that 200 pound battery pack would run it for six minutes. If you doubled the battery pack to 400, maybe 500, gee whiz, now we're up to 12 to 15 minutes of flight time. Now, sure, we read about airplanes and Pipistrel has done quite well with their uh, electric airplanes to, to their credit but basically they have an airplane that's more of a glider uh, that will stay in the air at a lower power output and they can get reasonable duration but a lot of times these durations are quoted in a in a slow flight mode the maximum so you're flying 60 to 70 mile an hour and um, just flying kind of straight uh, not a whole lot of fun, certainly doesn't really fill um, uh, a, a training role either. The mm -hmm. bottom line is that we're definitely paying attention, but referring back to my current sailplane, which was developed probably a good 15 years ago, since that time, the battery uh, energy has gone up maybe 15, 20%. So all of the overnight breakthroughs that people have been waiting for just haven't happened yet. Right. The automotive industry is spending billions on trying to develop better batteries. And I hope they can. And I'm yeah. sure there will be progress. But meanwhile, I don't, we don't necessarily see that in yeah. a year or two years. So for us to try and develop an airplane, even if we doubled or tripled the energy density, any airplane we developed would look like a powered sailplane in order to get any flight duration out of it. And then it's a matter of would you want that airplane that uh, to get any duration or range that you have to fly in a, in a slow flight mode to do. Right. 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Obviously, we, if you, like you said, it's not going to be in the next year, not, not, not in the next five years. But it is interesting to see those technologies arrive. Uh, at, at my own home airport, there's a company based there that's part of the, the uh, mobility revolution developing stuff. And they're, they're, they test fly pretty regularly using hydrogen um, uh, conversion to, to electric stuff. And, that, and they're, it's interesting to see. Obviously, uh, it, it, like you said, it's not happening any really soon, but maybe that'll be what, uh, what shows up in a Vans aircraft 15 years from now. Well, yeah, we'll have to see. As Ryan mentioned earlier regarding engines, we're not blind to advancing technology, but we are a very practical, uh, practical based company. You know, we, we, we don't have unlimited resources or not going out for big grants to do this research that it's got to, we got to kind of pay our own way. So, uh, not jumping into something that is not uh, a realistic bet at this time. Right. I so, think one of the things that people don't always realize is that we have a very... Oops. Oop, we lost Greg for a second. Oop, we lost Greg for a second. But we're a company of just under 90 people total, right? So we're not, we're not the, the ginormous corporation that uh, has lots and lots of money to be able to throw that kind of a problem. So. You know, we can we can rely on somebody else to help us with that. So so along those lines, tell us what you are been what you have that what you can tell us about what you have been investing in recently, in um, in the types of things that affect the planes themselves. What's what's recent? What's new? And and what can you tell us is on its way? If anything. <laughs> uh, uh, Van, do you want to take that one? <laughs> now, I wish we had more time to uh, devote strictly to uh, advanced design and, and research, which uh, we haven't. I think I'll pass it to Ryan and just, just see how he's able to. <laughs> we need a hot potato <laughs> emoji that just jumps you guys when I ask the question of what are you going to tell us that's new? Watching all of the, the political stuff now, we'll see how well Ryan can dodge this. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, bringing in all the new equipment uh, is aimed at bringing in new capabilities, and we are building towards uh, the future and uh, what types of, of systems we're able to develop. Let's, let's take one uh, system. Um, you know, we have BRS parachute. Uh, when is that going to arrive in an RV? Uh, when I can design it into an airplane properly. Uh, if we do it uh, currently, the, the systems are, you know, it's uh, too it adversely affects the CG. But I've always seen uh, one thing uh, equivalent to the parachute being auto land, and we've been talking about that with Garmin. Uh, we are part of the design process for G3X, uh, and and we'd we'd be part of the design process as well on, you know, Dynon, AFS, uh, other manufacturers. Um, so when you look at Autoland, there's a lot of problems you have to solve. And we have to come up with those technologies to control parts of the airplane we didn't before. Uh, with the machinery we're bringing in, we'll have a chance at, at doing that. Uh, it's not as simple as problem as you might think. So right. there's technologies like that. You know, when you sell an airplane, uh, after you've worked the booth at Oshkosh long enough, you realize that you're selling to the whole family. <laughs> And so when you can make the whole family feel safe because they can pull the parachute button, or in this case, I think, uh, you know, I can punch that one button and the airplane's gonna land itself. That will sell airplanes uh, and expand aviation to maybe a, a, a person who, you know, his, his family wasn't comfortable with it. So he didn't get into aviation or, or she didn't right. get into aviation. You know, that's a fascinating example, Ryan, because um, when, when you look at so many technologies that that often are easier to take to experimental aviation rather than the certified world, that's an example of one that actually, of course, has debuted first in the certified world. Do you think it's it's all about auto throttles? Basically, it's all about throttle control, or or is there more to it as there's to what's more to keeping it. that out of out of experimental? Uh, there's more to it than that. I, I won't get into it. We're under NDA, of course, but uh, there's more to it than that. Um, more 
hurdles that have to be overcome to get Autoland to function appropriately. You know, you know Garmin is taking on, in this case, or any if it's manufacturer is taking on a huge risk um, with it's a marriage between a manufacturer and a uh, uh, both manufacturers and both have to have a confidence in each other. So, you know, that's why a course occurred in the realm of the certified world that it did uh, or has so far. Um, for that to move down, there has to be a lot of technology developed um, before we see that in any light airplane. But it's exciting to see that come. On the flip side, you see EFIS systems that really started with AFS. I remember when Rob Hickman had uh, his little unit in his RV4, and pretty soon people started copying that. And you know that at, came in in 2008. And you can look at the safety statistics. Flight into terrain dropped by 60% over the period of, I believe, by 2013. It was somewhere in there. Um, huge dramatic effect. Uh, those things are exciting to see in aviation. Yeah, it, it really is amazing. So um, a, as we approach the the, uh, the end of the hour here, I, I have to ask, because of course, it's all filling up here and in, in all the questions that are coming in. So, so Vans, you chose in the big debate, high wing, low wing, in the very beginning, of course, you chose uh, uh, low wing. Uh, tell us a little bit about that choice and what your thoughts are in the future and, and with so many people asking. Will vans ever move in the direction of uh, of a high wing, or or think more of uh, uh, of of off airport type uh, operations? We never get that question. No, I'm sure <laughs> you've never gotten that question, question Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Very quickly, we started out with low wing airplanes primarily because I saw that fitting the the uh, my requirements. Uh, one of which was aerobatic. Normally, it's a better configuration for that usually viewed as being a little uh, slipperier, a little faster with a low wing configuration, just the overall sport airplane appeal. And uh, even though we've evolved away from the pure sport airplane into more cross country capability, uh, that configuration has suited our purposes in our market very well. Yes, you mentioned that the high wing um, properly designed um, could fit that mission pretty well. Generally, the high wing is preferred configuration for a small airport, uh, off airport landings, and uh, there is definitely an interest there. We're paying attention to that field, and uh, just stay tuned. We'll see what happens. <laughs> fair, fair enough on, on that as well. And 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 even without, of course, going to the high wing, I think Pilatus has shown us that uh, you can even make a jet go uh, uh, in rough conditions uh, with a low wing. So. Who knows, maybe you can accomplish the same goal without even moving the wing. Did you ever look at the size of the tires on an ME262? Uh -huh. Measure speed yet? It was definitely designed for grass field operation. Nothing yeah. new, nothing new under the sun. It, it, who knows, but hopefully, uh, so So no hints from you, but uh, we're, we're certainly hoping we'll get to see some stuff soon. So. Again, I would just like to thank uh, all of you, uh, um, Richard Van Grunsman, Ryan Johnson, Greg Hughes. Thank you so, so much for taking the time this evening to join us again here on Social Flight Live. Uh, it, it's great to see a, a company as strong as Vans Aircraft is and helping to support general aviation as much as all of you do. Um, and I'd like to invite everyone here who's joined us this evening, of course, to keep coming back every Tuesday evening for us here at Social Flight Live. Um, next Tuesday, October 20th, Mike Bush is here. We're going to talk about annual inspections. On the 27th, we have John Williams of Titan Aircraft. We're going to talk about building this uh, guy right here behind me here in my living room. And uh, then we skip a week for the election after we all recover. We are going to come back on November 10th and, and add some humor to it with Rod Machado. And so, again, uh, Van, thank you so much. Ryan, Greg, I know, Greg, uh, you, you were giving us a tour the whole time. You took. <laughs> thank you so much for walking all around. I know we weren't able to talk to you that much while you were doing that, but uh, I really, really appreciate it and everything you've done to set this up. It's no problem. I got my steps in for the day, so I'm good. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Van and Ryan, thank you so much. Well, you're most welcome anytime. Thanks for having us. All right, everybody. And for Social Flight Live, I'm Jeff Simon, Blue Skies.